coming up on this episode. This one right there and the one just below it are the letters HR, meaning har. Har is what we have in the Semitic languages, meaning an elevated position. Hi, welcome to Evidence for Faith. It's your host, Michael Lane. So glad you're joining me today as we are starting a whole new series on the Exodus. What is the archaeological evidence of the Exodus? What, what evidence is there? Who is the Pharaoh of the Exodus? Where, if, if the Exodus took place, where did all this take place at? You know, it's a very controversial thing. And the first question we have to, to delve into is, first of all, who was the Pharaoh of the Exodus? That's where we're going to begin with this lesson today. Who was the Pharaoh of the Exodus? Now, it depends on who you ask and stuff, because this is a frequently asked question of who was the Pharaoh of the Exodus. And I'll tell you, if, if you go around um, and ask people, uh, or even searching as I did, I went back and researched into ancient documents and, and uh, ancient sources and stuff, besides taking the Bible itself. Oh my gosh, there are so many different <laughs> different answers to this. You ask 10 people, you'll probably come across with 10 different answers. It's amazing. Uh, because the Bible, you see, just uses the term Pharaoh. It doesn't give us a name. It just gives us the title Pharaoh. So there are many hypotheses on these, uh, on the, the possibility of who this mysterious individual was. But as we take a look at this, I mean, the hypotheses that you come across, some, will, some are based upon people who don't believe in the Bible whatsoever. So they say that the whole Exodus thing is a myth. Others who believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God and is the source of truth, they'll say, well, it might be one of these. So we get different things like this. But the key is the Bible does give us clues. If you explore the Bible carefully, you will find there are different clues given in there on who this Pharaoh possibly was. Now, one major clue that you're going to come across, and it's very, very important to get this one, comes from the book of, of Kings. Now, who wrote the book of Kings? We don't know. According to Jewish tradition, the book of Kings was written by Jeremiah or his, um, his scribe Baruch. We don't know who actually penned it. God didn't seem that it was that important for us to know who did it. It's uh, a book of history of the Kings. And according to, to um, 1 Kings chapter 6, Verse 1, and I'll be reading this out of the English Standard Bible because we're going for accuracy. We're going to try and use a word-for-word -word, uh, translation through this. But in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, we get our first big clue, and this is a major one. It reads, In the 480th year after the people of Israel came out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, which is the second month, he began to build the house of the Lord. Now, what are we talking about? This is Solomon's temple. And we read here, it specifically tells us that 480 years after the first Passover. Now, remember, the first Passover, they're in Egypt. That's the one that was the, the plague of the death of the firstborn. And then they left Egypt. Between that period of time and when we have Solomon building his temple, according to 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, 480 years have passed. Now, in the biblical records, you have the rest of the books of the Torah, you know, the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. But then you have the book of Joshua, you have the book of Judges, and then you get into the book of Ruth and finally get into, you know, 1 and 2 Samuel. And it's in 1 Samuel, a lot of this then, uh, we get introduced to David uh, in the book of 1 Samuel. So we have that long span of times, about 480 years, is what the Bible tells us. Now, using other sources outside of the Bible, scholars have pretty much figured out that Solomon's temple would have been built somewhere around the mid-10th century B.C., or in other words, around 960 B.C. Now, remember, there's something that happens, though. As they leave... Egypt, in, after the Passover, remember the Hebrew people are disobedient to God and they end up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Now you're going to have to take that into consideration because that's going to come into play here. So they uh, wander in the wilderness for 40 years until finally, after Moses' death, Joshua leads them into Canaan, the promised land that God gave them. Now, since we have these dates, we can just use simple arithmetic. 
using simple arithmetic, if Solomon built the temple, say, as what scholars generally believe, is somewhere around 967 BC, going back then, 480 years from that point would bring us to about 1446 BC. Now, if you're taking notes, this is a date you want to write down because this isn't a key, key feature. In 1446 BC, then, would have been when the Passover took place. And then, remember, that there's 40 years that they're in the wilderness. Now, if you take that 40 years from the 4, 4, 1446, it takes you to 1406 as to when they actually entered in. Now, it seems like this should be so simple that we should be able to figure out, well, if we know roughly um, that the Passover took place, so the beginning of the whole Exodus thing takes place around 1446 BC, it seems like it would be so simple just to look through uh, Egypt's history um, and find out who was the Pharaoh at that time. Well, there's a problem with that because almost all Egyptologists, not all, but many Egyptologists cannot agree on the chronological order of the different Pharaohs. They all have different times for them. So it's not as simple as just, oh, we got the year 1446, let's see who was the pharaoh then. It doesn't work like that very easily because Egypt's history dates are not written <laughs> literally in stone to give us the idea of when this all took place. Um, also, adding to this, you have many scholars that, for one, they don't believe in the Bible. Two, they don't believe the Bible's accurate if they do believe in parts of it. Some think it's just a myth, this whole thing, that the Bible's not true at all. They have different ideas, different theories on this. And it's funny because they, I have found that even people who don't believe in the Bible will still give me a, a pharaoh of who they think the Exodus was, which sort of just boggles my mind. You don't believe in the Exodus. You don't believe in the Bible, yet you have a theory on who the pharaoh was. But in any case, let me just... Let me just give you a few moments here of, uh, take a few moments of your time to explain what some historians and, and authors and stuff have suggested where we get um, who this pharaoh was and, and uh, the possibilities. And like I said, if you talk to an, uh, somebody on this, you're probably, each person's going to give you a different, uh, a different name of a pharaoh here. It, it gets really bizarre as you go through this. Let's start with one. To begin with, let's go to the Jewish historian, famous Jewish historian, um, Josephus. Um, Josephus was um, a Jewish uh, historian. He was a general, and he wrote during the time of um, in the, the time of the first century A.D. He wrote the history of the Jewish people. It's a very interesting book to read the works of Josephus because it parallels so many things having to do with the Bible, but it also gives us a lot of history in between the Old and the New Covenants. But anyway, Josephus, who was a first century historian, Jewish, so obviously he's going to believe this did take place, he wrote in his, his works that it was probably one of the Tutmosis kings. Tutmosis. Catch that suffix part of the name there. Moses. Interesting. Now, how did he come up with that date? He used the biblical time frame generating from 1 Kings 6. We know that that was the time frame that he used in this. So that's what Josephus says. There's an Egyptian historian named Mathenao who lived about the same time as Alexander the Great. He lived around 323 BC. He wrote having to do with the story of the Exodus. He refers to it in some of his writings. And he said that he thought it was Amenhotep II. Now it's really interesting because when you study the time frame that many scholars put to Amenhotep II, it would fit the biblical time frame that we see starting with 1 Kings 6 again. There's another historian we can look at, his very famous Greek historian, um, uh, Karaman. He was from Alexandria in Egypt. He's Greek, but he also wrote um, about who the Pharaoh of the Exodus was. And he lived during the time of the apostles, during the time of the New Testament being written. He thought that the Pharaoh of the Exodus could be none other than Amenhotep II. Hmm. We got two people now saying that, two famous ancient historians. But it doesn't end there. Um, let's go to the famous Roman historian, Tacitus. Tacitus, the famous Roman historian, um, he wrote about this also, and he placed it during the reign of Pharaoh Bakken Ranef, who lived somewhere around, from what we figure in his time frames and stuff, around 725 to 720 BC. 
Now that goes against the biblical timeline because that would put us near the fall of the upper kingdom um, in Israel. So there's been many kings. So in other words, it's taking place during the book of 2 Kings or 2 Chronicles. Well, that doesn't really fit the biblical time frame. Another famous uh, historian that we rely upon often for historical records of the past and stuff, Diodorus. He was a first century Greek historian, first century BC, by the way. And he wrote that he thought that the Pharaoh was a female whose name was Hatshepsut. Now we're gonna come back to that one because she's a very interesting person. And just to let you know, it fits very closely to the biblical timeline that we read from 1 Kings chapter 6, verse one. But there's more. The Italian archeologist, uh, Emmanuel Anti, he recently wrote that he believed that the Pharaoh of the Exodus was none other than Pepi I. Now, Pepi I lived somewhere around 2390 to 2360 BC. Actually, that's closer to the time of Abraham. So it doesn't quite fit the biblical description, but that was his opinion of this. And I can't go on without mentioning archeologist Israel Finkelstein, who's often in the news today, and he's um, currently doing a lot of excavating in Israel and stuff. He said, and I'll put it in the way he phrased it, if it did take place at all, sort of gives you a little bit of an idea of his, his uh, worldview on this. It would have been Pharaoh Necho II. Well, Necho II lived around 600 BC. Again, that's during the latter part of the book of, of um, like for, uh, Second Kings and Second Chronicles during that time. So it doesn't really fit the time frame whatsoever. A lot of his ideas really go contrary to what the Bible says on many of his uh, papers that he, and books that he writes. Well, yeah, there's another one. A person who I really like to read a lot on, his name, he was an Austrian Bible scholar, his name was Alfred Edersheim, and he wrote that he believed that the Pharaoh was Tutmosis II. Ooh, we're back to these Tutmosis people. And again, this aligns very closely, as you're gonna see, very closely with the biblical timeline, Tutmosis II. Another person I wanna talk about is an author, very famous person, many people have probably read his books, Isaac Asimov. He was a very famous um, science fiction writer, but did you know he was also a scientist? He was very vocal about being an atheist, and he said if there's any truth whatsoever to this biblical or Hebrew myth, as he often called it, the Pharaoh would have been Mernapta, who lived somewhere around 1210 to probably around 1200 uh, BC. Again, this puts us into the period of the, what is in the Bible would have been the period of the book of Judges, according to 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. But you know, we can't, we can't leave this without talking about one of the strongest influencers of all time dealing with anything like this when it's coming to any type of story, and that's Hollywood. Hollywood has made numerous films. Oh, I'm sure you've seen Ten Commandments, Prince of Egypt, and others. And they've made so many of these. And if you've ever noticed, their pharaoh, their answer to the question of who was the pharaoh, they depict Ramses II. He's also known as Ramses the Great, who lived around 1280 to about 1210 BC. The thing is, again, according to the biblical timeline, this is taking, book, taking place in the book of Judges. It does not fit the biblical time frame. So it was not... I seriously doubt it was Ramses. Um, I mean, the list goes on. You keep asking questions, you're gonna keep getting different opinions. I, I went through and made a whole list um, on a, one week, just sitting and studying this, um, actually about two weeks, just I could not believe how many people have different opinions on this. Everyone has a theory. But I'm focusing on the history and comparing it to what I believe is the truth. And where do we find truth is in the Word of God. So by taking the Word of God, and we're going to explore the Word of God through this, and looking at the Word of God and seeing where does it take us through this, and comparing it then to Egypt's history, you're going to find something absolutely mind-boggling and fascinating. So that's how we're going to do this. We're going to compare the notes and the clues from the Bible and try to find a likely candidate to answer the question at hand. So to begin with, believe it or not, we have to go to the book of Genesis. Yes, Genesis. The Bible records that Jacob, towards the end of the book of Genesis, Jacob entered the land of Egypt during what most scholars would state was, would have been right around the 17th century BC. And if you recall the story, Jacob and his son Joseph, yes, the one with the colorful coat, um, and his other sons and stuff, they actually move into Egypt. 
course, Joseph is brought there under captivity as a slave but, and, and put in prison. But eventually, Jacob and his sons moved to Egypt also, and they settled there. For a while, his descendants, the Bible tells us, they flourished. They lived in peace there. In fact, if you look carefully at Genesis chapter 47, verses 5 and 6, you're going to see a little bit of a clue having to do with Jacob and the relationship he has with these Egyptians, with the Pharaoh himself. Um, he gets introduced to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh places him and his sons in charge of the royal flocks of Egypt. Now, being placed in charge of the royal flocks, that would make J uh, Jacob an elevated person. He would be not a king, but he would be, in some respects, a very respected person, like a vassal or a liege to the king. And we see this, like I say, in Genesis 47, verses 5 and 6. Look what it says here. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best of the land. Let them settle in the land of Goshen. And if you know any able men, among them, put them in charge of my livestock. There you go. So you see the relationship here. Pharaoh is honoring Joseph's father, Jacob, and even the brothers by putting him into this position. Now, according to this, um, in the, the book of Genesis, this time fits the, the time period of, um, in Egypt of a very peculiar time. Many people, unless you study this, most people don't know this. It has to do with the time of the Hyksos that are living in Lower Egypt. Now, this is very important to understand, too. To understand and identify who the Pharaoh of the Exodus was, you've got to know a little bit about the, the, how Egypt was set up during the time of the, um, the book of Genesis as it concludes. Um, at the time of the patriarchs, now during the patriarchs, I'm talking about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, etc., and his sons, Egypt was not a united kingdom. It was not a united kingdom at all. It was actually two different kingdoms. There was one kingdom, which is called, and if you look at old charts and stuff, you will see it's called Upper Egypt. Now, Upper Egypt was, the reason it's called Upper, it's further inland and up in the higher ranges of elevation. So Upper Egypt went back further away from this, uh, the Mediterranean Sea into the area along the Nile River, but that's where Upper Egypt was. But if there's an Upper Egypt, there was a Lower Egypt. Lower Egypt was another kingdom, and it was following the Nile down, all the way down to the river delta that goes into the Mediterranean Sea, that was Lower Egypt. Two different countries, both of them are Egypt, and each has their own ruling pharaoh. The, the country overall of Egypt that we often associate with, with Egypt was not one country yet. It was two separate countries. These two kingdoms basically got along with each other. Um, the upper kingdom was very dependent, though, upon the lower kingdom, the one down by the coast, for trade. Uh, the reason for this is many roads going to the other lands, like um, up to the, um, the Hittites, which would be in Turkey, or over to the Chaldeans, or even to uh, the land of Canaan, the, the Levant through there, or Mesopotamia. Most of those roads um, originated or went through lower Egypt. There were very few roads at all that you could go from Upper Egypt directly there. Matter of fact, you really couldn't. You had to go through Lower Egypt. So for doing trade and commerce, Upper Egypt had to deal with Lower Egypt in having access to all the roads and, and such. So the people who ruled Lower Egypt at this time of the patriarchs were called the Hyksos. The Hyksos seemed to have really good relationships also with Canaan and the Levant the area through there. Um, and we find this also being mentioned in the Genesis account uh, with Abraham, Jacob, um, Jacob's grandfather, and the first Hebrew people. The Bible tells us that they got along, and it wasn't a rivalry at this point, they got along. If you'll follow along, if you're, you have your Bibles open, it's Genesis chapter 12. I want to point out verses 14, 15, and 16. And what I'm looking for here, what I'm trying to point out to you, is the relationship that you see between Abraham, who's the first of the Hebrews, his relationship with the, the, um, the lower Egypt, the Hyksos people who were ruling there. 
It reads, when Abraham entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman, he's talking about Sarah, his wife, was very beautiful. When the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. The woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake, he, this is Pharaoh, for her sake, he dwelt well with Abram. And he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, camels. Do you see what's going on? Um, this was not one of Abraham's high points of his life. He's passing off his wife, um, who was also his half-sister, as just his sister. Um, but the situation, um, Pharaoh sort of catches, you know, he, she catches Pharaoh's eye, and he deals very nicely with Abram um, because of this. So the point I'm making is there's good relationships between them, and he's coming from the land of Canaan for this. So this type of association that we see between Egypt and the Levant, the area that is Canaan and stuff like that. It fits very well with what we read about the history of the Hyksos, um, the Hyksos people of the 13th through the 17th dynasties of Egypt. That's when they ruled Lower Egypt. And as you notice, this fits very well with the biblical account that Abraham was having good relations with these people. So we see that type of thing happening happening, and it sort of helps then how Joseph would be elevated into the court position with his um, being placed just under Pharaoh, that we see this. Um, this all fits very well with the biblical account, that um, the Hebrew people were getting very, uh, got along very well with the Egyptians at this point. Now, there is some archaeology to help back this up also, though it's not definitive. There have been several scarabs and seals. Seals were things that you would, um, this is uh, one, for instance, a seal. This one's greatly enlarged so we can see it better. I have um, smaller seals over on the side and on a display here with different type of seals. This one's just enlarged. But several scarabs and seals have been found in various places throughout the land of Canaan and also there in Egypt that date back to the time of the Hyksos people living in Egypt and ruling Lower Egypt. Now what's so amazing, particularly about this one here I'm holding, this one here actually has a name on it. And um, it's talking about, um, it, it's the seal, the stamp of an official person. But it does bear a name that's on here. And because this is a seal, it's like a vassal or a person of great influence. And um, if you recall, the Bible tells us that Jacob was put into that type of position. Now, some have found some of these little things here, um, these scarabs like this, that date back to the time of Jacob, have been found not just in, in Canaan and Egypt. Some have been found in a dig that's called Avarice, which is in um, the, the delta area of, of um, what would have been lower Egypt. And it is believed by many scholars that is where the Hebrew people lived uh, prior to the Exodus. And they have found these seals with this name on it. And right there in the land of, of Goshen. So here is the Jacob um, scarab, one of the 27 that have been found. There have been others, but you'll see these letters that you see here on the side. This, is, um, this part here represents like a Y or a J sound to us. So we have that J, and then there's the C sound, and then the B sound. So remember there's no vowels, it's Jacob. But then the symbols down below right here um, this one right there and the one just below it are the letters HR, meaning har. Har is what we have um, in, in the Semitic languages, meaning an elevated position, like a mountain or a, a high position. And that's why many people, many scholars believe this is referring to the Jacob that you find in the Bible, um, one of the patriarchs that we have, and how he was in charge of Pharaoh's flocks, he would have been in an elevated position. They found actually 27 of these with this imprint on it throughout the Middle East there that have been found to my knowledge. They have found 27. And because these people are dealing, the Hiscos with trade throughout the area um, with, with livestock and, and grain and stuff, it makes perfectly sense, perfect sense that this could be, it's possible, we don't know definitively, this could be the Jacob from the Bible. It fits the time frame. And it fits many other parts of this story. 
since one was found actually in the city of Avaris, where we find the Hebrew people living, and it was found very close to a statue of uh, a foreign ruler who was living in Goshen. Wow, that gets interesting in itself. Um, many scholars do believe that this could have been not just the dwelling place of the Hebrews, but that this could have been possibly a symbol dealing with Jacob in his elevated position as like a notary stamp, um, a stamp to put on seals and stuff. The time frame, the name, it's the biblical description. We see this. Now, if the biblical story of, of Joseph did occur when the Hittos were in power in Lower Egypt, it tells us then that they were being treated honorably. The Bible says this too. This would align beautifully with the book of Genesis and the account that we get how Genesis concludes. The Hebrew people and the lower kingdom Egyptians were cordial to each other. But then something changes. You get to the last page of the book of Genesis and you turn to the next one, the first chapter of Exodus, things abruptly change. So looking at Exodus now, chapter 1, verse 8, we come across a verse that is a major clue again. Now this verse is really interesting because it's telling us something totally new has happened. It reads, now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Mm. A new king has come into power. Now some people would just say, oh, the old king just died and new king came in. But he didn't know Joseph. That would almost seem to indicate the possibility that he is a king from a different area. Note that this king has come to power. Now, again, going back to the biblical time frame that we have found in Scripture, this would be the beginning of what is called the Tutmos dynasty. Now, we haven't really mentioned too much about this Tutmos dynasty, but what they did, they ruled Upper Egypt. The Hikos were the ones ruling Lower, and the Tutmos dynasty decided to unite to two kingdoms, and so they invaded Lower Egypt to take it over. So they did a coup d'etat, and they conquered the lower kingdom of, of Egypt, uniting the two kingdoms into one country, one powerful world force called Egypt. So up to that time, Egypt was two different countries, two different nations. Now they're united under the Tutmos dynasty. To get a little bit more clarity on this, I want to go to a, um, an article, um, a paragraph from an article written in the um, periodical called Let the Stones Speak. Now, Let the Stones Speak is an Armstrong Institute of Biblical Archaeology publication. And they have an article that came out in February 10th of 2023 that was entitled The Hikos, Evidence of Jacob's Family in Egypt. So for this, I'm just going to read this to you. I'm going to quote this uh, right out of the magazine and just see what these, these scholars are saying about what I've just explained. Quote, this statement by the new king over Egypt actually reads almost exactly like a text known as the Carnarvon Tablet, a mid-16th century inscription by the native Egyptian pharaoh Kamos, who feared that the Hittites were getting too powerful and needed to be overthrown. For what it's worth, as the inscription reveals, Kamos' advisors protested against this nationalistic pharaoh, stating that the Hikos were doing nothing to threaten Egypt and were instead maintaining trade opportunities. Nonetheless, Kamos dismissed his advisors and went to war against the Hikos. It was during this reign of Kamos' successor, Amos I, that the Hikos were entirely overthrown, overthrown, and the new kingdom period began, with all of Egypt united under one powerful, domineering native Egyptian ruler starting circa 1550 BCE, end quote. This gives us a lot of information on that, and it even mentions this, this other archaeological find that helps support this whole idea. Now, according to Bible, Bible time frame uh, that we have from 1 Kings chapter 6, using that as a reference point, this fits very well with this, what's called the New Kingdom period. The New Kingdom period, this, this new dynasty coming in, this new 
new uh, period lasted from 1550 BC to 1070 BC. In other words, from 1550, um, that's fitting what we're going to see a very important um, role here as the, um, during the time of the Exodus, like this is the beginning of the Exodus, because this is in Exodus chapter 1, to 1070 BC is just before you get to the time of King Saul and David's dynasty in Israel. Now, during this time, this New Kingdom period, there were three specific Egyptian dynasties that ruled Egypt, identified by the Tutmosid, Tutmosid, that's the 18th dynasty, um, which was the greatest, by the way. And as I said, that one ran from 1570, as it started, 1550 right in there, to about 1300 BC. But then there were two other dynasties afterwards, still part of this new kingdom area, which was called the Ramesid dynasty. Now that took place from about 1300 to about 1070, or right up to the time of um, Saul and, and David, etc., into that time period. Now that we've established that the 18th dynasty had a major change and fits with the biblical description, particularly how Genesis ends to how Exodus begins of this Exodus period, we can get some more information now to who the ruler was, who was ruling at that time, and who could possibly be the most likely candidate to be the Pharaoh, the infamous Pharaoh of the Exodus. Now, as written and mentioned in the article I quoted you, um, there is a tablet that's called the Karnarban tablet. On this tablet, it refers to Amhos I conquering Lower Egypt, removing the Hyksos from power. Then what he did, and this is, this is so cool, what he did next is he expanded Egypt's borders. In doing so, he set up an expansion for building projects, according to this. Now, after he died, his successor was Tut Moses the first. Again, I have to refer to that suffix of the name, Moses. Tut Moses the first. He comes to power, ruling all of Egypt, and he implements a tremendous building project um, all through the kingdom, actually. Again, this fits the biblical account of needing slave labor for construction. Because remember, the Hebrew people were not in slavery. Now they're put into slavery during this new kingdom. And so, here we have this fitting with the biblical description. As it says in, first, or in Exodus chapter 1, starting at verse 9, reading through 11, we read about this Pharaoh making this statement. It reads, And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses. Now this is interesting because Tutmosis I, his, his life story reads almost like a soap opera. It is so interesting what all takes place. It's a very interesting history of this family. His royal wife, whose name was Amos, bore him a daughter whose name was at Shetsup, as you'll recall, that was one of the historian's ideas of who the Pharaoh was. Hat Shetsup, that's his daughter. And um, Tutmosis I also had a concubine, Mutnofret was her name, who bore him a son. And he named that son, obviously, Tutmosis II. Now, at this time period in Egyptian history, it was very common to keep the bloodline for succession pure. So what they would often do is they would have brother and sisters marry in the royal family. That's what we see occurring here. And we do know this took place. And like I say, it was to keep the succession going. We discover through Egypt's history that Hatshepsut did marry her half-brother, Tutmosis II. Now, he was a teen when they got married. So he marries his half-sister, Hatshepsut, but Tutmosis II was never a very healthy person. He was a sickly child from what we can read in, in all the details that the Egyptians left for us about his life. Um, he did a very short reign. He didn't live very long, um, a short reign. But in, during this short reign, he did put down some rebellions in distant lands. So the, the new kingdom is trying to expand out. But one thing that is noted about Tutmosis II was his extreme cruelty to male children of less important people, like slaves. 
He was extremely cruel. Um, he had a daughter with Hatshepsut. Nethreru Ra was her name, but she's a female. Um, he goes on and has an affair with, or I should just say, a, he had a second wife or a concubine, you might say. Her name was Iset. Iset actually fathered a son for him, whose name he gave was Tutmosis III, who would grow up without his dad because soon after Tutmosis III is born, Tutmosis II dies. And as his son is an infant, he cannot take over the throne. Without an adult um, heir, they needed to have a new pharaoh. So what ends up happening is Hatshepsut replaces uh, the king, Tutmosis II, as the new pharaoh. Um, yes, it was his sister and his wife of Tutmosis II, but she assumes the role of pharaoh. Um, bypassing, this is important, bypassing this infant son, who's really, I mean, at this point, he's too young to rule. So Hatshepsut now becomes the pharaoh. Hatshepsut is one of the most interesting people I've ever read about in Egypt's history. I love reading about her. Many books have been written about her, and uh, her tomb is, is well known. It's a big tourist attraction today. Fascinating story about this, this gal. Um, she was a female in a male-dominant world. There's no question about it. But when she assumed the role of pharaoh, she went so far as even dressing as a man. She would even wear a fake beard um, when she would go out among the people and stuff. Now, Hatshepsut was brilliant, an extremely intelligent lady. Um, and so what she did, she worked upon primarily the culture of the people and um, the finances and, and things to, to make Egypt really, really prosperous. And during her time, it was mostly as she started her reign, it was a time of peace. And Egypt just prospered. It was like they became so rich, they became so powerful um, and, and wealthy at this point. She began several building projects, which her father and um, had also started. She continued on this. As a matter of fact, as I mentioned her tomb before, Hatshepsut's tomb is a magnificent structure, rivaling many other features that you find in ancient Egypt. It's a very popular tourist attraction, and it shows, again, how intelligent she was to have all of this done, and also the splendor of her kingdom at this time. So she was just something uh, of a paradox to many other type of uh, pharaohs that you see. And reigning for about 20 years, Hatshepsut only had one daughter. And scholars believe that she longed to have a, a son. Now, some scholars, Egyptologists, have suggested that she be, was so dedicated to her role of pharaoh, she didn't go off after her husband died and have other children and stuff with um, male concubines or whatever, that she put her endeavors and her energies into the country itself. But they also state that she longed to have her own son because she knew her daughter would never be able to become Pharaoh, especially with Tutmosis III growing up. So, according to some Egypt houses and some of the books I've written, it appears, this is sort of speculative, but this is what they, they believe, many believe, that Hatshepsut went down to the Nile god, Happy of the Egyptians, and prayed for a son though like supernatural means because she could not, she was not gonna marry somebody else. And that the Nile god Happy um, actually granted her request and gave her a foreign male child that she found in the Nile. She brings this child into the house of Pharaoh and raises him in the house of Pharaoh with all the education and everything that the new Pharaoh would need. Now, this unknown, because we do not know the name of the person, who this son was. We do not know the name from Egypt's history. But what's really interesting, after a while, he just seemed to disappear. And like I say, all signs of his name are removed. But we have no idea who he was, really. But isn't it interesting how this fits the whole story of Moses' birth and how he came to be into Pharaoh's house? Doesn't this seem to sort of be similar? You, know, you can't help but see some correlation between this, this adopted, unnamed foreigner and the story of Moses that you find in the Bible. If it is true, one could obviously see then why there'd be animosity between this foreign child being raised under Hatshepsut 
and Tutmosis III, who is the rightful heir as time goes on. Well, what ends up happening? As successful as Hatshepsut reign was, the infant Tutmosis III is going to grow up, and he does. And he's destined to become, if you've never heard of him, I, I'd be a little surprised, he was the greatest pharaoh in Egypt's history. This guy was brilliant. He was a military genius, for one. Um, he was destined to become the greatest pharaoh and extend the borders of Egypt to the farthest extent they would ever be in its entire history. Because he conquered all the way up into Turkey, which is where the Hittites were. He conquered into lower Turkey, across over to like the Tigris, uh, Euphrates rivers, into that area, and he conquered down to the south of, of Egypt and across North Africa. I mean, this guy is sometimes called the Napoleon of, the, uh, of Egypt because he was so into expanding the borders. So that's what he was doing at first as he co-reigned, Hatshepsut lets him co-reign, but then um, he's becoming more and more powerful. Where Hatshepsut was so dedicated to increasing the financial and the cultural aspects of Egypt, Tutmosis III was a conqueror. And his, his exploits are still studied in military schools to this day. Now, Tutmosis III, as he gets older, and he is the rightful heir, uh, male heir of this, um, he, somehow he seems to really despise Hatshepsut for, some, for obvious reasons, I think, but he probably even more. He led a coup d'etat and removed Hatshepsut from the throne. She died about a decade later. Um, according to Egypt's history, she died, would have been just before uh, Moses led the Hebrew people out of the nation of Egypt. Tutmosis III eventually orders, then, the removal of Hatshepsut's images throughout the kingdom. That is why today, if you look this up, or if you go to Egypt or different museums, you see very, very few images. There's a few that have survived that came from her tomb. But most of her images have been defaced. Her names have been chiseled off. And exactly why he ended up hating her so much is partially a mystery, but we can pretty well guess, you know, it's because she was ruling and maybe even possibly having someone else in mind to be the successor after her. I mean, there's many theories that abound on this, but we do know, there is no question about it, that what ended up happening is he had her name removed from almost all monuments, had it chiseled off. To let you understand how severe this was, that Tutmosis III really despised Hatshepsut, here is an image of a photograph we took at the Penn State Museum. And this is a famous lintel. It's called the lintel of Hatshepsut and Tutmosis III. It has both their names on there. But if you'll notice on the image, on the two lower lines on the left, a section of it has been chiseled off. You can see hieroglyphics written across, but in the two bottom lines over on the left side have been chiseled off. And that's where we know the name of Hatshepsut was. So after um, Tutmosis III takes over the kingdom, he orders her name removed. And you see this all through Egypt. This is not the only place you see this, um, but this is a clear example of what I'm talking about. He really did not like her for some reason. Um, as it continues, Tutmosis III, as I said, was the most powerful and the greatest pharaoh of all. He ruled for 54 years. That's the longest rule of any pharaoh in its history. And that long, that long reign itself, 54 years, that fits the biblical time frame that we have. Because according to biblical time frame, if you recall, Moses is kicked out of the land. Well, if Tutmosis led this coup to get rid of Hatshepsut. Um, he obviously would have got rid of, of the adopted son, so he flees for his life. That makes perfect sense. And Moses is gone for 40 years. This fits into this time frame. According to the Bible, Moses fled to live in the land of Midian. Now we read this in Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. We read, During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. And God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. This is the period of time, then, that Moses is fleeing and taking out of there, and the people are doing what? They're in anguish. Now, Tut Moses III, let's get back to his story for just a second. Tutmosis III married a gal whose name was Satai, 
who bore him a son named Amen Emmat. Now, Amen Emmat um, is someone you've probably never heard of. Um, his, his mother, Satai, died soon after giving birth, and this firstborn son, Amen, and, uh, Amen Menthat, he died also in childhood while his father was still reigning. Thus, we know for certain he cannot be the Pharaoh of the Exodus. No. But then, Tutmosis III remarries. He remarries a person named Meretre Hatshepsut, who bore him many children. The oldest son that he had was named Amenhotep II. Now, remember from the beginning of this lesson, many people thought Amenhotep II, who's in the Tutmosis dynasty, was the one who might have been Pharaoh. So let's take a look at this guy now. When Amenhotep II became Pharaoh, he, did, he became Pharaoh at the age of 18, and he inherited the greatest kingdom the world had ever seen. Now, like his father, he started off with military campaigns, and he went into Canaan after the death of Tutmosis III. Of course, there's going to be some people going to rebel because this guy was a major conqueror. Well, during, his, uh, during Amenhotep II's third, seventh, and ninth years of his reign, he put down rebellions up in Canaan. Amenhotep II also is noted, this is key, to be extremely cruel, especially to slaves. We know this from writings on the walls in different areas and different monuments and stuff. There are many reliefs in Egypt detailing slaves, for instance, making mud bricks for his building projects out of dirt, straw, and water. Does that sound familiar with the biblical story? Because it fits with the Hebrew slaves making bricks. Look at Exodus chapter 5, verses 5 through 9. And it reads, And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens. The same Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their foremen, You shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks, as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the number of bricks that they, have, that they made in the past you shall impose on them you shall by no means reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry, let us go and offer sacrifice to God. Let heavier work be laid on the men, that they may labor at it and pay no regard to the lying words. Hmm. So he's treating the slaves very badly, and this fits with Amenhotep II's character. Now another major clue that we get dealing with the identity of the Pharaoh of the Exodus, that it would be Amenhotep II, is because of something that's found really interesting in ancient writings. You see, it tells us in the Septuagint. Now, the Septuagint is a Greek copy of, that was written um, before the time of the New Testament, in between the Testaments. The Septuagint is the Greek Old Testament. And it, um, it is a very important work. Many scholars and pastors and stuff study this very carefully because it is a Greek copy of Hebrew scripture. It contains something in there talking about this period of time that the Israelites, the Hebrew people, were constructing a city called um, Helopolis. Let me read this out of Exodus chapter 1, verse 11. This is the English translation from the Greek here. Um, of what Exodus 1.11 says from the Septuagint about this taking place. And he set over them taskmasters who would afflict them in their work. And they built strong cities for Pharaoh, Pithoth, Ramses, and On, which is Helopolis. The Greek translation of the Old Testament includes the city of Helopolis. Now, not all copies do. Um, other ancient, uh, older manuscripts and stuff, but this one does contain it, that it mentions. And some translations actually put it in there also, that one of the cities that the Hebrew slaves built was Heropolis. We know that Heropolis was built during the reign of Amenhotep II. Now, Amenhotep II reigned for 26 years. And though much, we know much about his early reign. The first part of his reign, there's a lot of history, a lot of details, a lot of monuments and stuff like this. But something happens. During the latter half of his reign, hardly anything is mentioned. There's just no information. There's nothing. This is extremely puzzling. 
because Egyptians often wrote all sorts of things about their pharaohs. You study any other pharaoh, you're going to find everything, uh, things written about their life through the whole time they're reigning. Not so with Amenhotep II. Halfway through his reign, everything becomes silent. Really interesting. Even his statues are found incomplete. Now, he did also continue to remove any images that were left over of Hatshepsut that were not removed by, uh, before by his father. Um, so there still seems to be some type of hatred between Amenhotep II and Hatshepsut. But there are a few murals that have, have survived and that you can see about his early reign. And in his early reign, Amenhotep II appears from all indications that he was a very healthy person. He was extremely athletic. Um, he led campaigns, military campaigns. He was an athlete. But why is there such a lack of images and descriptions of the latter half of, of his reign? It's a mystery. And like I say, since Egyptians often detail victories and conquests, yet they don't often talk about defeats and bad things that happen in their reigns, it's interesting that the second half of Amenhotep's reign should be in silence. Thus, we have to speculate. Could it be that the plagues of Egypt occurred during this time? The Egyptians certainly would never have memorialized what was going on in their kingdom. A great discovery happened in 1898. Amenhotep II's mummified body was discovered by an archaeologist named Victor Loret. It was totally intact. It hadn't been um, attacked by grave robbers. It hadn't been plundered or anything. His tomb was totally intact. As a matter of fact, until we found King Tut's tomb, it was the only Egyptian tomb, royal tomb, that we had found, ever found that had never been touched by grave robbers. So it was an intact one. Now, inside this tomb was the royal sarcophagus that they found in there also. And it was totally undefiled. When they opened and started to study the remains of his mummy, uh, they found that it had extensive damage that was done to it. Many scholars believe that it was a type of disease or plague that he was attacked by. Um, his skin shows, and you can see pictures if you want to look up pictures or see pictures of his mummy. It's very well known. It's covered in tubercles and, and growths all over. It's, it's very hideous to look at. And now some will say, well, they did the embalming wrong. Why would they do embalming wrong on him, but they don't do it on the others? No, it, it appears many um, pathological experts and stuff have studied this, and they believe it was some type probably of a disease. The exact cause of his death has never to this day been determined, what killed him. But speculating, could his death, could this condition of his body indicate that there were plagues coming down from Egypt resulting in the exodus? And this fits the biblical time frame. There's also evidence that certain foreigners, we read about this, certain foreigners in Egypt were performing some type of magic in the second half of his reign. And that he actually commanded his people to not pay attention to these magicians that were doing this. Again, speculating, could this magic from these foreigners be Moses? and Aaron doing these miracles? The plagues of Egypt? Hmm, it fits a biblical account. Another piece of evidence supporting Amenhotep II as the Pharaoh of the Exodus comes from a stella, a monument, if you will, right by the Great Sphinx of Giza. We all know the Great Sphinx. There is a monument at the front of that. It indicates that Amenhotep's oldest son, appears to have died mysteriously in youth. Whoa, isn't that interesting? His name, according to the Stella, was Amenhotep, um, who would have been likely then the heir to the throne, but he died mysteriously as a youth. Because of that, his deceased, uh, because he was deceased, his brother, Tutmosis IV, succeeds him as the new ruler in his place when he dies. Again, this fits the biblical story with Passover. Exodus chapter 12, verse 29 reads, at midnight, the Lord struck down 
the firstborn in all the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive, who was in the dungeon, and the firstborn of the livestock. This fits this very interestingly. Finally, one more piece, amazing piece of information and to this puzzle of who, uh, of Amenhotep being possibly uh, the, the Pharaoh of the Exodus. If you recall, I mentioned a city in the land of Goshen named Avaris. Avaris has been excavated for a, memory, a, a number of years now. They're still working on it. And they believe that this was definitely a Hebrew type or semantic uh, village that was living in the lower part of Egypt. Now, what's amazing is it, uh, about this, it's in the land of Goshen, which the Bible tells us that's where the Hebrew people lived. But what's fascinating about this is all of a sudden, that city, Avaris, is shown to be totally just abandoned. That the people who were living there just got up and left. When did this take place? During the reign, the second part of the reign of Amenhotep II. And we know that this was a semantic place because the style of the houses are not Egyptian. They're more like what you would find with the Hebrew people. Hmm. So was Avaris abandoned during the reign of Amenhotep II because the exodus took place? Interesting. I mean, we're speculating here, but there seems to be a lot of evidence to support this. It does fit the biblical time. So just to wrap it up, let me give you 10 quick points that we've covered here as to why I believe that Amenhotep II is most likely the candidate to be the pharaoh of the Exodus. First of all, several ancient historians actually named the, him as the pharaoh of this. Um, some Greek, some Egyptian, they all said that Amenhotep II was the pharaoh and that it took place during the 18th dynasty. So we have ancient history, historians telling us that was the, the case. Um, they don't all agree, but there's a couple that studied this, and that's what they wrote. Second, the passage in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, gives us a starting point to determine when the Exodus possibly took place. This would fit perfectly, absolutely perfectly, with the biblical timeline of Amenhotep II. A third point, Amenhotep was the son of Tutmosis III, who was the stepson of Hatshepsut, who, according to the Bible, may have had a daughter um, of Pharaoh who um, may have been the daughter of Pharaoh who found um, this foreign child and raised him into the court to be possibly a successor of Hatshepsut. But then Tutmosis III takes over. This fits the biblical account also, um, gives us reason why Tutmosis III would find such animosity to this stepbrother that he had, this adopted foreign child. Um, and it would also give reason why Amenhotep II would not appreciate this, these people either. A fourth point. We know from, from writings that have survived dealing with Amenhotep's reign, he was extremely cruel to slaves. This, again, fits the biblical description. A fifth point. This one I think is key. How I told you that Amenhotep is said to have built cities. One of the cities was Hierapolis. And the Bible in the Septuagint anyway, and a couple of translations, actually include that city as one of the cities that the Hebrew people built. It's right there. A sixth point. Many of the details, as we said, of Amenhotep II's early reign are featured in his, his history and what they wrote. His athletic prowess, his three conquests. But the second half of his reign is totally silent. Could this be an indication of the fall and the desolation of Egypt. A seventh point, Amenhotep II's mummy, his body has been discovered, has been studied, and it's covered with all sorts of tubercles all over. He was definitely cursed with some type of plague or disease. That sort of fits again with the idea of the biblical account with the Exodus and the plagues. It's possible. His death is a mystery. An eighth point, Amenhotep II wrote specifically, and I find this fascinating, wrote specifically that foreigners were in the land during the latter part of his reign, what little part we know about it, but there were foreigners there who were doing magic, and he commands his people not to listen to them. Does not that sound like the Pharaoh from the Exodus account in the Bible? 
The ninth point, his oldest son dies mysteriously and his second oldest then succeeds him. Could it be that his oldest son died during the first Passover? It makes perfect sense. And then lastly, number 10, how the city of Avaris, which was a Hebrew city, it appears, semantic people living there, which was thriving for a long period of time, all of a sudden everybody gets up and leaves during the time of Amenhotep II's reign. It seems to fit the exodus taking place. So the evidence suggests, of what I can determine, that of all the pharaohs in Egypt that could possibly be the candidate to be the infamous pharaoh of the exodus, Amenhotep II reigns supreme on this. He's the top of the list. It fits very well with the biblical description. And from what we read in the Bible, you can see how many things parallel from the history. This is what's so cool, how the history of Egypt's history, Egyptology, and how the Bible are parallel in so many aspects here. Coincidence? I don't think so. I believe that the Bible's true. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining me on this lesson as we will be continuing and we'll go now into the Exodus in the next lesson. Um, and I hope you'll join us for that. The, the pictures and the films that we're going to be showing you are just magnificent of the archaeological discoveries to support that the Exodus actually took place and where it took place. This is amazing stuff. So thanks for joining me. And until we meet again, take care and may God bless. Support the show. Become a donor at evidenceforfaith.org give. 